to front lines, women in the Great War. So in the summer of 1914, following the assassination of the Austrian Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife Sophie, uh, Europe erupted into war. The First World War, known then as the Great War, would last four long years and see over 60 nations ultimately join the conflict. New technology of war, such as flamethrowers, tanks, poison gas, and new forms of artillery caused destruction on a level never seen before. In 1916, in a single day at the Battle of the Somme, 60,000 British soldiers lost their lives. A year of fighting at the French town of Verdun uh, resulted in over a million dead. You can see the aftermath of that there, the cemetery at Verdun. All told, an estimated 8.5 million soldiers died in the war, and casualties for both military and civilians reached an astonishing 37 million. As Europe tore itself apart, America's President Wilson declared a policy of neutrality. But that neutrality would not last. U.S. trade and travel was threatened by German submarines, and the sinking of the British passenger liner Lusitania in April of 1915 resulted in the deaths of over 1,100 people, including 128 Americans. Still, in 1916, Wilson was re-elected, in part because he helped keep America out of the war. But America was gradually being pulled in. By 1917, the Germans resumed unrestricted submarine warfare, uh, sinking several American merchant ships. This, along with the discovery of the Zimmerman telegram, prompted Wilson to ask Congress for a formal declaration of war against Germany on April 2nd of 1917. America joined the war just four days later on April 6th. Many women supported America's entry into the war, believing Wilson's proclamation that the war was, quote, to make the world safe for democracy and would be the war to end all wars. Some women saw the war as an opportunity to prove their patriotism and to take full advantage of their rights as citizens. Some hoped that their activity in the war would prompt the nation to give women the right to vote and to allow them more equality in politics and labor. Many women saw their husbands, fathers, and sons join the armed forces, and they supported America's entry into the war as a way to support their men. Now, as men joined the armed forces and left for France, the United States experienced a labor shortage. As war broke out, immigration to America was cut off, Nearly four million American men joined the armed forces. That was one out of every six male workers in the country. American women picked up the slack, and they began to fill the jobs left behind by the men now serving. Some 40,000 women in the Northeast took jobs as streetcar conductors, railroad workers, metal workers, and munitions makers, taking over the jobs traditionally held by men. Between 1910 and 1920, the number of female clerical workers doubled as men, um, as women received jobs in secretarial work, as well as in government bureaucracies. I like this poster. <laughs> the war allowed women to quit their low-paying jobs, such as domestic service, and gain better-paying jobs in heavy industry. African American women took advantage of the changing labor conditions too, often moving up into the jobs left behind by white women. Some did take jobs in factories as well, such as in Chicago's meatpacking plants. And all told, nearly a million women worked in industries directly related to the war effort, and over 10 million women worked in some capacity during the war years. During this time, poet Jesse Pope wrote a nice poem about the things that girls are doing during the war. She says, there's the girl who clips your ticket for the train and the girl who speeds the lift from floor, uh, floor to floor. There's the girl who does a milk round in the rain and the girl who calls for orders at your door. Strong, sensible, and fit, they're out to show their grit and tackle jobs with energy and knack. No longer caged and penned up, they're going to keep their end up till the khaki soldier boys come marching back. Similar events occurred in England as nearly two million women replaced uh, men at their jobs. Their work also ranged from shipbuilding to munitions manufacturing to nursing to clerical work. In France, women in the workforce uh, grew by nearly 20%, even though women had already made up a higher percentage of the laborers pre-war than they did here in the US or in England. 
In both England and France, women joined the trade unions and engaged in labor unrest during and after the war. And in all positions, though, women continued to earn less than men did at the same jobs. But still, it was more than women had made in previous occupations. Now, support for the war came in various forms. Carrie Chapman Catt helped in the creation of the Women's Committee for the Council of National Defense, known as the WCND, in 1917. It's an organization set up um, to form local branches and to help organize women's participation in the war effort, so ways to get women to volunteer in the war. It met with limited success, though. Uh, women organized parades and marches to raise money for the wartime liberty bonds that helped to fund the war. They worked to raise money for the Red Cross and to create relief funds for European refugees. Uh, they organized rationing efforts, helping to conserve resources like meat, grain, sugar, coffee, things that were needed for the troops. They promoted the planting of victory gardens to grow your own fruit and vegetables at home, and they advocated canning to preserve crops longer, and above all, to uh, prevent wastefulness. In a lot of ways, they sound like my mom when I was little. Don't waste food. In England and America, women joined up with the land army. As men left for the war, even farming jobs were left unoccupied. So women took up the slack there too, working the farms to provide food for the nation and its soldiers. In Britain, the case was pretty dire. They imported more than 50% of their food supplies, uh, pre-World War I. And after 1914, you have German submarines blockading the island nation and preventing supplies from arriving. There's a point in time where Britain is basically on the verge of famine. At that point in time, you'll have uh, about a quarter of a million female volunteers flocking to the countryside, milking cows, planting crops, plowing fields, harvesting, and basically saving England from famine. There's our land, or our land army. Doing all of this too, our women in England at least gained a real sense of independence in the process. They're now out in the countryside, away from their families, and uh, experiencing life in different ways. And this was really something that women would not forget. In England in 1919, Parliament passed the Sex Disqualification Removal Act, making it illegal to disqualify women from work because of their sex. Still, plenty of restrictions on women's lives remained in effect post-war. The Women's Land Army of America did similar work here in the United States, known as Farmerettes, a nice name, they plowed, planted, harvested, and canned food, and they were paid equal wages with men. This is a result of the labor shortage, which gave women quite a bit more bargaining power. Perhaps the most shocking feature of the farmerette was her pants. She stopped wearing dresses and skirts and moved into some different fashion. The Women's Land Army of America was modeled on the British version, and women worked a variety of agricultural jobs. A lot of them were actually here in California, both in Southern California and here in the Central Valley. At the outbreak of the war, some 15,000 Americans traveled to Europe to aid in the war effort. So this is before America even joins. A few American women traveled to France, joined up with the Ambulance Corps. Author Gertrude Stein and her partner Alice B. Toklas uh, both drove Ford Model T ambulances for the American Fund for French Wounded. They're participating in the war. Um, Gertrude Stein bought the car herself. She paid for it with her own money. And it shipped to France because the French only had about 40 ambulances at the outbreak of war. And it was determined that was not enough. Uh, Walt Disney and Ernest Hemingway both also drove ambulances during the early years of the war, both in limited capacities. Uh, Stein and Toklas are having a pretty good time while they're over in France. They actually learned how to drive to do this. Uh, their driving lessons didn't go all that well. The first thing they did was wedge their Model T between two railroad cars. <laughs> Had to have it pulled out. But still helping nonetheless. Women joined the Women's Christian Association, the YWCA. It's a women's counterpart to the YMCA which provided housing for single working girls and offered help to families of men recovering in hospitals. Black women's work was often segregated, but they also worked for the YWCA. They rolled bandages, worked as nurses, 
uh, collected money for war bonds, collected money for relief work, and they also assembled first aid kits for their own auxiliary, auxiliary of the American Red Cross. Some women worked with refugees, particularly coming out of France and Belgium, and many women did flock to the American Red Cross, which grew tremendously during the war. Uh, the Red Cross had just over 100 chapters in 1914, and by 1918, just four years later, there's 4,000. A pretty dramatic increase. In England, women volunteered for the Voluntary Aid Detachment, or the VAD, which provided nursing services throughout the war. During World War I, American women were allowed to uh, serve in the armed forces for the first time. Tens of thousands of women enlisted in the Army, the Navy, the Coast Guard, and the Marines, but most of them worked clerical jobs, filling positions to free up men for service on the front lines. Uh, some worked as nurses, and 11,000 yeomanettes worked in the Navy. Uh, they were the first women to don uniforms in the service. Over 1,600 women received assignments overseas, mostly in France. Uh, while women were allowed to serve as nurses, they were not allowed to serve as doctors. So female doctors would either sign up with the Red Cross, or some actually joined up with the French army, which did allow women to work as doctors towards the end of the war, as the need for them increased. Women serving in these capacities often risked their lives. Nurses Edith Ayers and Helen Wood were the first American women killed in the line of duty during the war. During a practice uh, drill on board the ship they were serving on, a gun exploded, and both women were hit by shrapnel and were killed. So women played important roles during the First World War. In 1917, as the Americans entered the war in France, considerable problems developed regarding communication. A newly installed telephone system helped connect the troops and provided much needed pathways of that communication. But the telephone system, which still required switchboard operators, was run solely by French women, and most Americans didn't speak French. They could not either uh, understand them nor speak to them. Uh, and so as a result, 450 American women were brought over to man the switchboards for the Americans. They had to be bilingual in French and English, and many had experience as former switchboard operators here in the U.S. They underwent military training, they received training in radio and switchboard operations, and then they served under the U.S. Army Signal Corps. They bought their own uniforms, were issued dog tags and gas masks, and they became known as the Hello Girls, so working with the phones there. They served throughout the war zone, often on the front lines and under fire. They worked round the clock at times, 24-hour shifts, uh, maintaining communication between troops. At war's end, the Hello Girls asked for an honorable discharge. They asked for pensions, but they were refused both on the grounds that they were civilian volunteers and not actually part of the armed forces. And this was a definition that was uh, determined simply because they were women. Most of them returned home and then disappeared into their normal lives. It's not until 1978, President Jimmy Carter finally recognized their work in the war, um, gave them veteran status, but at that point, most of them had already passed away. We do see opposition to World War I. We see that arising even before America's entry into it. Progressive leaders like Robert La Follette, socialists like Eugene Debs openly opposed America's entry into the war. And many dissenters felt that the war was one of imperialism and conquest and not one to spread democracy. Some felt that the war was simply not America's business. President Wilson's Secretary of State, William Jennings Bryan, resigned his position in protest to the war. And women did dissent against the war as well. Carrie Chapman Catt, who was leader of the suffrage organization NASA, the National American Woman Suffrage Association, she joined the Women's Peace Party, as did Jane Addams. She promoted peace. She hoped to find a way to negotiate an end to the war in Europe without America's involvement. Catt said, quote, when war murders the husbands and sons of women, it becomes the undeniable business of women. Note her strong language there, saying that the war murders them, men who participate in it. And she felt strongly that women as wives and mothers were deeply affected by the ramifications of the war, that it was as much women's business as it was men's. Women, according to Kat, cared less about the politics of the war, but were um, more about the emotional impact of losing a loved one. 
This argument focused on women's traditional gendered role in the family, but Kat managed to use it to great effect. And she's not alone in this sentiment. Uh, still, uh, when war broke out and America joins, Kat left the Women's Peace Party. She did feel on some level that it was wrong to protest her president and her country during a time of crisis, but it was also in part a strategic measure. Uh, she felt that if she promoted women's work, uh, their patriotism, and their support of the presidency, she could hopefully use it later to gain the right to vote. She was always a very shrewd politician, um, even though she sometimes disguised it when it benefited her. Under Kat's leadership, the uh, NAWSA, through its backing behind Wilson, supported America's entry into the war, so she switched sides. Still others stuck to the idea of dissent despite the unpopularity of such a stance. Jane Addams, who is a founder of the Settlement House Movement in America and an advocate for immigrants and laborers, she took a very strong stance against the war. The Settlement House Movement uh, sought to aid immigrants in America's urban centers, uh, providing services such as free daycare, health uh, clinics, employment centers, uh, various classes, um, and even America's first public uh, playground. By World War I, Adams was the most famous woman in America and a critical player in the progressive movement, heavily involved in American politics. She served as the head of the Women's Peace Party. She gave frequent lectures and strongly opposed America's entry into the war. The Women's Peace Party formed state branches and employed maternalism, believing that women's special position as wives and mothers gave them a unique perspective on the war that men simply could not understand. It was the same position that Carrie Chapman Cat is taking. And now while this allowed the WPP to promote peace, it also upheld traditional gender roles, viewing women as maternal, emotional, and active. The stance of these women was reflected in the popular wartime tune, I didn't raise my boy to be a soldier, which tells us 10 million soldiers to the war have gone, who may never return again. 10 million mothers' hearts must break for the ones who died in vain. Head bowed down in sorrow in her lonely years, I hear a mother murmur through her tears. I didn't raise my boy to be a soldier. I brought him up to be my pride and joy. Who dares to place a musket on his shoulder to shoot some other mother's darling boy? Let nations arbitrate their future troubles. It's time to lay the sword and gun away. There'd be no war today if all mothers would say, I didn't raise my boy to be a soldier. It was one of the first true anti-war songs, and of course it met with both criticism and acclaim. The peace movement loved it, Teddy Roosevelt hated it, and many parodies of it popped up at the time, including, I didn't raise my boy to be a coward, and I didn't raise my girl to be a voter. <laughs> In early 1915, 50, uh, 47 members of the Women's Peace Party joined an international peace conference in The Hague in the Netherlands. Jane Addams was one of the attendees. All told, some 1,300 female pacifists gathered at the convention representing 12 different nations. Here, they spoke up against the war and debated ways to bring it to an end through mediation and negotiation instead of violence. They also promoted the idea of women's suffrage. Together, they, they created the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, which is an organization that is still around today, continues to work for peace, equality, and an end to exploitation and oppression. Upon her return from The Hague, Adams tried to meet with Wilson to discuss her ideas, and when she couldn't get his attention, she uh, stalked Henry Ford, got financial backing from him, and traveled to Sweden on the Ford Peace Expedition to Stockholm, yet another peace conference. Her activity for peace continued throughout the war. She faced booing crowds, the press abandoned her, and she was frequently accused of disloyalty. But in 1931, Jane Addams became the first American woman to win the Nobel Peace Prize for her both in the Settlement House movement and in the political sphere as an advocate for peace and arbitration. Not all politicians supported America's entry into the Great War either. In Congress, Six senators and 50 representatives voted against America's entry into the war. Jeanette Rankin, a representative from Montana, was the first woman to serve in Congress. And in 1917, she was actually the only woman in Congress. She answered the roll call by saying, I want to stand by my country, 
but I cannot vote for war. I vote no. She would later lose re-election, probably because of her stance against the war, but she would rejoin the House of Representatives in 1940, just in time to be the only dissenting vote on entering World War II against Japan following the events at Pearl Harbor. She justified her position saying, as a woman, I cannot go to war, and I refuse to send anyone else. Her position was, of course, unpopular. After America's entry into World War I, Wilson set out to maintain public support for the war, noting that if there should be disloyalty, it will be dealt with with a firm hand. The Espionage Act of 1917 and the Sedition Act of 1918 both sought to limit freedom of speech in the press, making it illegal for anyone to print, write, or speak out against the war, the government, the Constitution, the flag, the U.S. military, encourage soldiers to desert, interfere with the draft, or to incite, provoke, or encourage resistance to the United States. It's a very broad, far-reaching piece of legislation. Together, the Espionage Act and the Sedition Act represented the most drastic restrictions on freedom of speech and freedom of the press since the Alien and Sedition Acts of 1798 during John Adams' administration. They were used harshly against those who openly opposed the war or the draft. But opposition to the war still came. Socialist leader Eugene Debs, then 62 years old and in poor health, was sentenced to 10 years in prison and lost his citizenship just for delivering an anti-war speech in Canton, Ohio. When he ran for the presidential election in 1920, he did so from his prison cell, probably our only candidate thus far to do that. Kate Richards O'Hare, a socialist journalist from the Midwest, claim that any person who enlists in the army of the United States will be used for fertilizer, implying that an enlisted soldier was as good as dead, and that his corpse would act as fertilizer for the grass and trees growing on his grave. It was a strong image, and aimed to prevent men from enlisting. She was staunchly against the draft, and this one speech earned her five years in prison. She was pardoned in 1920 after a nationwide campaign to secure her release. At Wellesley College, Professor Emily Ball was fired for opposing the draft, and so even in the halls of learning, uh, they were not open to dissent during the war. Britain had a counterpart to this legislation known as the Defense of the Realm Act, which was passed just as the war broke out in 1914, granted the government emergency powers, including limitations to uh, free speech and the press. As in America, people were jailed, Nearly half of the suffragists in Britain also opposed the war, and they tended to join the peace uh, organization side by side with Jane Addams. Some of the strongest opposition to the war came from Emma Goldman, a radical anarchist. She felt that the Women's Peace Party was too tame, too moderate, and thus formed the Anti-Conscription League, organized to fight against a draft which she felt was unfair. She even found the socialists and the feminists a little too moderate for her standards. She felt that Germany wasn't the enemy, but the war itself was. While the League did not offer advice to those who were drafted, or at least that was their official public position, it did offer support to those who had already refused. As an anarchist, Goldman felt she could not rightly tell others what to do. During the short six weeks the League was around, she wrote defiant manifestos, she gave speeches, and was an all-around nuisance to the American government. Vehemently anti-Wilson, she still held back from outright telling people to deny the draft. That would have landed her in jail, and she knew it, so she chose her words very carefully. On May 18th, 8,000 people gathered to hear Goldman speak. From the podium, a soldier gave a speech defending the draft and defending the war. Goldman let him talk. She wasn't about to deny anyone else their freedom of speech. He's an interesting character. The following month, she gave a speech declaring that the draft would create a funeral march for 500,000 young men. People in the audience yelled at her, go back to Russia. And they threw light bulbs and glass at her onto the stage. At that point, she reminded her followers that the soldiers were there simply to provoke them and to not play into their hands. And so they walked away. Goldman probably actually prevented a riot at that point. She continued to give speeches, but on June 15th, she was arrested for inducing persons not to register for the draft. Police confiscated all of her paperwork and her writings, uh, which she never saw again. 
She went on trial, and it took her 12 jurors just 39 minutes to find her guilty. <laughs> Sentenced to two years in jail, a $10,000 fine, and deportation from the country upon her release. And it shipped her back to Russia. Goldman was unrepentant. Between the trial and the start of her jail term, she visited her sister in New York, and while there, she tried to convince her nephew not to enlist in the army. So she's still fighting. She was unsuccessful. He enlisted, he served in France, and he died in the Argonne Forest just days before the war ended. At 50 years old, Goldman served her time. Upon her release in 1919, she was ordered to leave the country, which she reluctantly did, returning to her home country of Russia, though she later lived in England, France, and she finally died in Canada. Her death in 1940, she was finally granted permission to return to the United States, and so her body is buried in Chicago. Now, Carrie Chapman Catt, Jane Addams, and Emma Goldman are each representative of women's varying political ideologies and experiences during the war. While Catt remained political, she backed off when the war uh, raged on. She reversed her stance, supported Wilson. Adams continued her activities for peace throughout the war, unhindered, unconcerned by either Wilson or public opinion. And Goldman was the radical individualist, fighting her beliefs at whatever the cost. Now, the war's emphasis on democracy and the increased patriotism in the United States also helped to propel the movement for women's right to vote. As Wilson said in his message to Congress, we shall fight for the things which we have always carried nearest our hearts, for democracy, for the right of those who submit to authority to have a voice in their own government. This rhetoric of democracy and having a voice in government stirred up suffragists who were fighting for, yes, that very thing. Carrie Chapman Catt, who was then president of the National American Women's Suffrage Association, used her leadership to focus and concentrate the efforts of various grassroots groups into one voice. The suffrage movement had been gaining momentum throughout the progressive era, and it reached a peak right as the war broke out. It began drawing in more college-educated, middle-class women, but it also brought in really wealthy women like Alva Vanderbilt Belmont and Maude Younger. Likewise, working class immigrant women began to join the suffrage movement in larger and larger numbers. By World War I, the American suffrage movement had a relatively large class base, though it remained primarily a white woman's movement as it would throughout its existence. Alice Paul, on the radical side of the movement, formed the National Women's Party in 19 breaking off from NASA. Alice Paul and her fellow radicals picketed the White House 24 hours a day, carrying large posters and often using Wilson's own words against him. As um, author Jean Baker notes, they were the first American activists to ever picket the White House and the first group to ever employ civil disobedience and passive resistance in direct confrontation with presidential authority. Paul questioned Wilson, asking, what are you doing for the women in America? Mr. Wilson, you say that every people have a right to choose the sovereignty under which they shall live. What about 20 million American women? She strategically used the war to point out the hypocrisy in America's rhetoric and actions. She wrote, at the very moment when democracy is increasing among nations in the throes of war, Women in the United States are told that attempts at electoral reforms are out of place until the war is over. The Democrats have decided in caucus that only war measures shall be included in their legislation program and have announced that they will take up no new subjects unless the president considers them of value for war purposes. No war measure that has been suggested would contribute more toward establishing unity in the country than with the giving of suffrage to all the people. It will always be difficult to wage a war for democracy while democracy is denied at home. Pretty strong words. 168 suffragists were arrested, tried, uh, jailed on charges of obstructing traffic. 97 suffragists served up to six months in prison. Paul noted that they were imprisoned not because we obstu uh, obstruct traffic, but because we pointed out to the president the fact that he was obstructing the cause of democracy at home while we are fighting for it abroad. Their use of hunger strikes while in prison helped propel the movement further, bringing national attention to the cause of suffrage. Most who went on hunger strike were force-fed. 
Two months after New York voted to enfranchise women, the House of Representatives passed the Susan B. Anthony Amendment. Wilson's speech in Congress drew on the themes of the Great War. He said, we have made partners of women in this war. Shall we them only to a partnership of suffering and sacrifice and toil, and not to a partnership of privilege and right? Wilson made it seem that voting rights were a reward and not a right of American women. The amendment failed, two votes short. The following year, they tried again and gained exactly the two-thirds majority they needed. 144 years after the founding of the American nation, American women gained the right to vote. African American women, however, would find their votes blocked by the same measures that disfranchise African American men, poll taxes, literacy tests, and voter intimidation by groups like the KKK. Alice Paul, now president of the National Women's Party, continued to work for change. Throughout the 1920s, she gained support for the Equal Rights Amendment and continued to run the NWP. In England, suffragists used similar strategies, invoking citizenship rights and their par uh, participation in the war as justification for suffrage. Women's roles as nurses, laborers, and patriotic supporters of country and king provided an argument for the vote. Women emphasized their sacrifice, including the loss of their husbands and sons. Uh, men who refused induction into the army in Britain actually lost their right to vote. Now, once Britain did that, it became really easy for British women to take that claim and use it to gain the franchise. Uh, once they decided that manhood was not the prerequisite for rights, but participation in your country and your citizenship duties, then um, women were able to turn that around. In 1918, Britain passed the Representation of the People Bill, which was the broadest reform act in British history. It doubled the electorate, giving votes to five million men and nine million women who could not vote before. It still had limitations. Only women over 30 could vote, which actually left out most of the women who participated in the suffrage movement. At the war's end, in 1918, with the outbreak of the Spanish influenza pandemic, now women's work in this proved just as vital. Women worked as nurses, as uh, 50 million people uh, worldwide, and an estimated 675,000 Americans died from the outbreak. Women took up their place to fight, their disease, uh, to fight the disease. Women worked at bedside care. They prepared food. They fed those afflicted by the illness, they delivered uh, meals to the sick and to their families. And as historian Nancy Bristow notes, their work was often applauded as women's self-sacrifice and was widely admired. Much of the discussion of women's work during the influenza pandemic was gendered, often discussing women's proper role in society as nurturer and caregiver. Some compared women's work in the influenza sick wards to the soldiers who died in the war, both doing their gender duty for the preservation and protection of the future. According to Bristow, a Red Cross report noted, this is a record of accomplishment that attempts to set down some of the heroism of the stay-at-homes. A mother, a daughter, perhaps a sister, who show courage and humanity as richly to be prized as those of a father, a son, or a brother overseas. While men's place seemed to be in the armed forces fighting the Germans, Women's Place was at home fighting germs. A Red Cross article celebrating the work of a hospital superintendent said, her service during this time was so unselfish and heroic as the service of nurses at the front, and there is no greater sacrifice than the one she has made. Bristow's research also uncovered a poem by a student nurse in New York, urging other women to join the fight against the enemy of influenza. Titled Your Chance, the poem relates you who longed for a chance to fight hand to hand with a foe braving death, do you not understand that the worst foe is here? And so here is our chance, for all of the fighting is not done in France. You women who thrilled with fine purpose before, it is now you are needed, for this is our war. The magazine it was published and noted the author died from pneumonia during the pandemic, as did many women who worked <coughs> excuse me, as nurses during this time. Now, Bristow suggests that the military rhetoric used to, um, uh, to describe women's work, work in the influenza wards helped to make their sacrifice even more meaningful and to show that they 
like the soldiers uh, left buried in graves in France, died serving a higher purpose. A tribute published by the New York City Department of Health noted, the supreme sacrifice offered by these workers, quietly and without thought of distinction, ought to rank them with those heroes who have given their lives in France for country and civilization. Now the changes wrought by World War I helped to usher in the 1920s. Some blamed women suffering for the changing attitudes and lifestyles of American women. Others blamed the war. In reality, it was a long process and a combination of factors that helped to create the flapper generation of the 20s. Self-proclaimed flapper Ellen Wells Page said, We are the younger generation. The war tore away our spiritual foundations and challenged our faith. We are struggling to regain our equilibrium. The times have made us older and more experienced than you were at our age. It must be so with each succeeding generation if it is to keep pace with a rapidly advancing and mighty tide of civilization. Everywhere we read and hear the criticism and distrust of older people towards us. It forms an insurmountable barrier between us. How can we turn to them? In our flapper generation, increasing sexual and political freedom did not necessarily translate into a transformation of traditional gender roles. Post-World War I, very little had changed in terms of women's economic independence or their workplace equality here in the US. As soldiers came home from the war, women were displaced and terminated. Most Americans still held the belief that only certain jobs were appropriate for women. And the biggest gains women made in labor were in jobs they already dominated, like nursing and secretarial work. African American women found themselves pushed out of their jobs too. One thing that did change post-war was the management of women's work. In 1920, the Women's Bureau was created to oversee women's wage labor and to investigate workplace conditions. While World War I did give women tremendous opportunities to travel, uh, to gain new jobs, to serve their government, it also did reinforce traditional gender stereotypes. Women faced uh, discrimination and inequality in jobs, preventing them from attaining high-level positions as supervisors or managers. But they did gain jobs as bank tellers and department store clerks and secretaries. And throughout the post-World War I era, uh, women did enroll in college in larger and larger numbers. In the decade of the 1920s, uh, women's enrollment increased by 20%. While the war helped women gain the right to vote, it was not universal. French and Italian women had to wait till after World War II. In Switzerland, women will have to wait until 1971 to gain the right to vote. In England, we'll see the results of the war more dramatic and long-lasting than here in the U.S., and also very different from what American women experienced. Historian Virginia Nicholson relates the story of Mae Jones, and her story is pretty representative of the generation of British women post-World War I. Mae wrote her memoirs when she was an older woman, giving details of her youth, her school years, growing up in the era before the war. She met a young boy named Philip, and the two quickly fell in love. They have been friends since the age of six, and gradually romance blossomed between them. He was smart, he was destined to attend college at Cambridge, and May describes him as a kind boy, introducing her to poetry and nature, sharing with her his love of art, and helping to tutor her cousin. The two were inseparable and began planning a wedding after five years of courting. Then the war erupted. As a pacifist, Philip refused to fight, and he spent time in jail where he learned first aid and how to treat the wounded. When he was released, he felt he should put those skills to work and he volunteered to go to France. He carried no gun, but he retrieved the injured from the field of battle. May waited patiently at home until Philip was due home on leave. According to Nicholson, as May wrote her memoirs some 60 years later, everything remained vivid. She wrote, then everything was shattered. A letter came from the war office to say he had been killed in action. The shock and loss was terrible. I felt I had lost half of myself. I knew then that I should die an old maid. In faint letters penciled in the margin, she added, I was only 20 years old. And there her memoirs end. We know nothing else about her. She didn't feel any need to continue her story. Now the sense of loss pervaded everywhere. Vera Britton's fiance Roland was killed. He was hit in the stomach by a volley from a machine gun. 
He lived for 24 hours after doped up on morphine. As a nurse, Britton understood exactly what Roland's death meant. The agony, the pain, the fogginess of the opiates, the knowledge that he likely died not even thinking of her or his loved ones, but in a haze of pain and drugs. She wrote, one recovers from the shock, but one never gets over the loss, for one is never the same after it. I have got used to facing the long, empty years ahead of me if I survive the war, but I have always before me the realization of how empty they are, and will be, since he will never be here again. And what was the point, she often wondered. She tortured herself with Roland's loss for years. After spending a beautiful spring day outdoors, she wrote, suddenly I remember Roland is dead, and I am not keeping faith with him. It is mean and cruel, even for a second, to feel glad to be alive. As a novelist, Irene Rathbone asked, what was the use of winning the war if none of the men who won it were to live? In 1917, the senior mistress of a school for girls in Britain addressed her students at assembly. She says, I have come to tell you a terrible fact. Only one out of 10 of you girls can ever hope to marry. It is a statistical fact. Nearly all the men you might have married have been killed. You will have to make your own way in the world as best you can. The world has made more openings for women than there were before, but there still will be a lot of prejudice. You will have to fight. You will have to struggle. In 1918, at war's end, there's a surplus two million women in Britain. Two million more women than men. The schoolmistress was correct. There would not be enough husbands to go around. Some women would have to create their lives without men. Single women were everywhere in the 1920s and 1930s, and they did develop independent lives. They learned to live for themselves and make new meanings of their lives. Vera Britain became a journalist, a writer, a political activist, a lecturer for the League of Nations, a traveler. Women got jobs. They learned to support themselves. They bought their own houses. They adopted cats. They made friends with other single women in a similar predicament. Some wallowed in their despair, while others embraced the independence a single life brought. Either way, the war and its tremendous, terrible death toll changed British women in unforeseen ways. Miss Mary Freeman writes after the war, she says, remember that it was the spinsters that kept the country going. It was not only us here to remember the men who were killed in the First World War, there weren't any men to go around. All of my friends are Miss. We had a family of four neighbors here, all unmarried. There's Miss Roberts there, and ourselves, and next door here. And I think that the Sugdens had a spinster in the family, hadn't they? And the Webbs, Dory was a spinster. It's not a bad life. There's a lot to be said for it. The important thing is to enjoy it and be enthusiastic and take everything that comes. Virginia Nicholson tells of one of these surplus girls, Elizabeth Googe, who spent her life as a spinster, childless, and alone. But as she learned, she wasn't really alone. According to Nicholson, Elizabeth loved bountifully. Her mother and her father, her nanny, her friends, the many strangers who wrote to her about her books, her dogs, her friend Jesse Monroe, and above all, her God. There had been loss, there had been grief, there had been heartache, but in this woman's life, joy tipped the scales. Thank you. <laughs>